Okay, good morning everyone. So today we start computability theory. I've put a whole bunch of notes on the website, maybe seven or eight. I didn't count exactly, but a lot, maybe even 10. Uh, and these will cover the topics from now till um, Tuesday. Yeah, so the next, this, and the next two lectures after that. That's a lot, and there are many things that I realized I didn't put in the schedule that I feel uh, would be really cool to do. So I may sacrifice Lambda Calculus in the end as well in order to accommodate all these things. So let me tell you the story as it unfolded in 1900. So in 1900, there was the International Congress of Mathematicians, which is held once every four years. And this continues to this day. So the next one is due in 2022. And it is at this that the Fields Medals are handed out and all kinds of other things happen. But in 1900, Fields Medals hadn't been started yet, but it was the change of the century. It was a new century. And David Hilbert posed 23 questions for the mathematicians of the 20th century to think about. And these questions became famous, they became called Hilbert's problems. And basically, if you solve the Hilbert problem, you became famous. So von Neumann solved two, I believe. Uh, and there are some which are still open and some which only got solved 100 years later. <coughs> so the Riemann hypothesis is on this list, still unsolved. So one of the questions on this list led directly to the invention of the subject we all study, computer science. And this was problem number 10. Find a procedure according to which it can be determined by a finite number of operations whether a solution exists to a given Diophantine equation. And what he was doing, he was groping towards the concept of algorithm when he said finite number of operations. A Diophantine equation is simply an equation in some number of variables where you require that the solution be integer. Sometimes you modify it and say you want a solution in rational numbers. So of course the most famous Diophantine equation is Fermat's last theorem, which asks the question whether for n greater than or equal to three, are there non-trivial solutions to the equation x to the n plus y to the n equals z to the n. And after a long, long time, people um, were able to prove, basically in 1994, Andrew Wiles proved that there are no solutions to this equation for n greater than or equal to three. So that's an example of a famous Diophantine equation that took a very long time to resolve. So David Hilbert wanted to know, basically in today's language, is there an algorithm which you can just feed to, uh, to which you can just feed Diophantine equations and ask for solutions? And he was convinced that there was. So of course, when he says, find a procedure whereby it can be determined by a finite number of operations, he's basically asking for a terminating algorithm. And it took a long time, but in 1970, a young Russian mathematician aged 22 called Yuri Matyazevich proved that this was undecidable. And of course, in order to get there, you had to first formulate the notion of undecidability. And this was done with, there was a lot of activity uh, in this area and lots of people proposed notions of algorithms, uh, many people in fact. So in the United States, Emil Post and Alonzo Church, in uh, Russia, Markov, in uh, Austria, Kurt Gödel, and of course, in the United Kingdom, Alan Turing, who gave the definitive answer to which we all adhere now. So <clears throat> actually in 1935, Alonzo Church proved the existence of unsolvable problems. And in 1936, Alan Turing also proved this. So Church was slightly ahead, except Church proved it in the Lambda Calculus, which nobody understood. And people were saying, what is this? Why is this anything to do with algorithms? But in 1936, when Turing invented what's called the Turing machine, people realized this is it. 
And Kurt Gödel said, this is the compelling definition of what the word algorithm means. So Turing machines had a central historical importance in formulating what do we exactly mean by an algorithm. Uh, later on, maybe a couple of years later, Alan Turing actually did a PhD under Alonzo Church at Princeton. And in the process of his PhD, he proved that Turing machines and Lambda calculus were equivalent. So in fact, people after the fact realized, oh, well, Church has proved this in 1935. And various people came up with different notions of what the word algorithm should mean. So Kurt Gödel was before all of these people, but his notion actually is too restrictive. And it basically corresponds to a programming language in which you only have four loops with fixed endpoints. You can say four, one to 10, or four, one to 100, or four, one to N, but you cannot have while loops, which kind of keep iterating until some condition is met. So in Gödel's notion, algorithms always terminated. There was no such thing as a non-terminating algorithm. And there were many things that you cannot code up in, um, in Gödel's formalism. And in fact, one of the earliest examples of this was something called Ackermann's function, which you may have heard of. Ackermann invented it to show that here is something that's clearly intuitively computable that cannot be expressed in Gödel's formalism. So that was kind of a not quite successful attempt. So this compelling successful attempt was Alan Turing, who did three fundamental things in that paper. And they're so fundamental that we don't even realize it. We tend to take it for granted and just assume without even thinking about it that these concepts are there. So the first contribution was a compelling definition of mechanical procedure, what we call algorithm today. And this is embodied in the definition of Turing machine, which is what we're going to discuss for, for a few minutes today. The other crucial, crucial fundamental thing he did was the demonstration that algorithms could be encoded as data. Before that, people thought algorithms is something in your head. You know, you, 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 you explain to somebody how to do it. But he said, he showed how to encode a formal algorithm as data in symbolic form. And now you can have a single universal machine that interprets the algorithm. You don't have to say every time I'm changing my algorithm, I'm taking my wire clippers, cutting out the wires and reconfiguring the machine, which is what people thought before. So the idea that there's something called a universal single machine, which executes all conceivable algorithms simply by storing the algorithm in symbolic form, which we call a program today, <laughs> and executing that program, this was Turing's feat. So this is unbelievably incredible, right? Because everything that we take for granted, oh yes, there's a thing called code, there's a thing called a programming language, there's a thing called a computer that runs programs. All these were due to Alan Turing. And before that, people just said, well, there are things that are called calculators and you have to reprogram them by hand by changing the mechanic, by changing the machine structure to run different algorithms. So the idea of a universal machine was there in Turing's work. And thirdly, uh, the thing that we're concentrating on for the next few days, he showed the existence of algorithmically unsolvable problems. So this gave a big step towards answering Hilbert's original question. So now it says there are unsolvable problems. All this, of course, freaked out Hilbert because Hilbert had made this famous statement, uh, which he said very passionately in German, which I can't do because I don't know German, but he said, we can know, we must know. <clears throat> and so uh, the first blow to Hilbert's desire to know everything was, of course, Gödel's incompleteness theorem, which basically said there are true propositions of formal logic that cannot be proved, at least of arithmetic. And this was a complete shock five years after that, there exist problems for which no algorithm is possible. And this is a thing that many people who don't formally study this don't even know. They just think, oh, uh, get a big enough computer, you can do anything. And they only think that the limitation is the size of the memory or the size of the speed to handle you know, big data problems. But that's not the case. Unsolvable problems are not unsolvable because the data is too big. It's because of logical contradiction and essentially because of diagonalization. So that's what we're going to do today. 
So the first thing I want to do is share screen, which I haven't forgotten. I just wanted to make this little historical uh, discussion before I started sharing the screen. So let me do that now. Okay, so the first thing I want to do today is to show you the existence of unsolvable problems. And of course, for Turing and people like that, it was quite difficult because they first had to explain that there's this thing called software, which of course was not the terminology that they used. Um, but in our modern language, it's actually very easy because we take for granted programming constructs. So I'm going to do it in kind of high level pseudocode. There is no algorithm. That can analyze algorithms and their inputs. and determine whether the algorithm holds or not. Okay, so first notation, because this is a bit unclear, it has the algorithm and so on. I'd like to actually give things names. So I'm just going to give you some notation first. We'll write S for an algorithm. I'll write S of X for running algorithm on input X. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'll write hashtag S for the code of S in ASCII, let's say. So in those days, everything had to be coded up as an integer and there was this thing called Gödel numbering which showed you how to do that. Um, <clears throat> goodness gracious me. Okay, so, <clears throat> but of course now it's much more convenient for us to just use ASCII text and we know that things like if then else and so on are part of any standard programming language. So everything becomes very simple for us and this proof is going to look extremely simple and uh, naive. So some more notation, I'm going to write S W down arrow for S halts when run on X, when run on W. Okay, all just means it stops. And I'll use up arrow for S runs forever. We like to say S loops. Hmm? So one of the things that torments us is when students in Comp 202 write programs that don't halt and the TAs in Comp202 probably wish there was an algorithm that could just scan the program and determine whether or not this one is going to halt. And this is of course exactly what we're about to show is impossible. So it looks like a straightforward problem. Um, so we'll assume, so is this notation clear to everyone? Up arrow, you don't halt. Down arrow, you halt. <clears throat> So assume we have a program 
H, which takes two arguments. So I'll give it two slots. And H, when you give it the code of some program and some input, which is possibly just another string, it will say true if when you run S on X, it halts, and it will say false when if you run S on X, it loops forever. H itself always holds. Okay, that's our assumption. <clears throat> so to say that you actually have an algorithm that answers a question, it means that when you run that algorithm, it will halt and say yes or no. It's very easy to write an algorithm that says, oh, gee, I don't know. <laughs> uh, right? You can write an algorithm that answers any question, like if you're allowed to say, gee, I don't know, because you just say, print, I don't know on the screen. This is an answer to any question. So, <clears throat> um, so when we say we have an algorithm that answers the question, we mean it always holds and tells you for sure whether or not the given thing holds. You notice how things that we're kind of taking casually for here were, you know, big breakthroughs in Turing's time, like hash mark S. We're just saying, yeah, the code of a program. Of course, we write, we write programs and the program is just a piece of text. This is, by the way, another amazing thing that there's just a piece of text, but there's this notion of running it and producing an effect called an execution. Okay, so we're assuming H exists. We're going to write another program called P, define P of X to be if H X X, then loop forever. Else, Halt. Now you might wonder what is this HXX? So it says you take whatever string is given to P and you copy it and give both the arguments to H. Use it for both arguments to H. So the first one you're now interpreting as a program. And somebody might say, well, it might not be a program, it might be just an arbitrary string. That's correct. It might be an arbitrary string and not a program, in which case it certainly halts because the first thing the compiler will do is crash. Okay, so we consider that halting. <clears throat> so the fact that it might or might not be a valid syntactic program in whatever programming language you're using is not important. Okay, so now we can ask. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so this is a perfectly good program. We, the only assumption built into it is H exists. And loop forever is easy to write in any programming language. For example, you can do while true do x gets x. And that's a loop forever. So loop forever is very, very easy to write in any modern programming language. Okay, but now we've written this new program P. So the question is, I'm going to give P its own code as input. And now the question is, this or this. Okay, so let's analyze it. So what is P? P is the program I've written just there. So this becomes if H code of P run with code of P as input, then loop, else halt. So if P actually halts, then H says yes, 
or true, but the true branch loops. So then we conclude, oh, in that case, this can't be right. So it must be that P run on its own code actually loops forever. But then H says false, because H always halts and it always gives the right answer. So it says false, but the false branch halts. And so we've got a contradiction both ways. What do we conclude from this contradiction? A program like P cannot exist. But if you look at P, there was nothing dramatic in it. If then else, loop, halt, all those things we can do, we know we can do. So what's the only thing that was suspect? H. H cannot exist. So some time ago, when the computer science department was making sweatshirts and hoodies for people, I got this one made. And I walked around on the streets wearing it and random people would stop me and say, what does that mean? And I would say, right. <laughs> I would start explaining about uh, the halting problem and they would tune out and say, oh my God, I thought you were gonna tell me something interesting. But anyway, <laughs> I claim this is a very interesting fact. The dramatic, thing about this proof is how easy it is. There's absolutely nothing to it. All right, so, <clears throat> so we have dealt with the first phenomenon in computability theory. There exist problems that cannot be solved. And basically we're going to analyze more and more problems like this. You might think, oh gosh, well, this is some peculiar uh, computer science kinky thing. And of course, anything of real interest will always be solvable, but this is absolutely not true. All kinds of things that you would never have imagined turn out to be unsolvable, including many, many, many problems in pure mathematics and especially in group theory. So there were many questions about, oh, is it true that in, uh, for every group, I can always answer the question that this word is equal to that word. A word in a group is simply a sequence of elements from the group and you just multiply them out. So then I take another sequence and multiply them out and I ask the question, so do I get the same element in the group? This turns out to be an undecidable question. <clears throat> yeah, Rahul, scratch your head. <laughs> it is a fact. This is an undecidable question. All kinds of simple problems in geometry, undecidable all kinds of simple problems in not theory, undecidable. <clears throat> okay, especially problems in topology. Many of them turn out to be undecidable. So undecidability is woven into the fabric of mathematics, It's not some kinky thing in some corner. Right, so the next thing I want to do is discuss what is meant by a Turing machine. Um, and I, wrote some notes on Turing machines. So one of the things I'm absolutely not going to do, <clears throat> so here are my notes on Turing machines. They're on the website and it's all formalized. So what I'm not going to do is spend ages and ages talking about Turing machines, giving you like seven examples of things you do with Turing machines, giving you assignment questions, write a Turing machine that does this, that, and the other, as happens in many computability courses. Because for one thing, it was great. Alan Turing invented Turing machines. He really convinced us that this is what computability means. But for God's sake, after all this time, we know better programming formalisms. Even Python is better than a Turing machine. So 
anytime I want to show you an algorithm, I'll use some kind of modern looking pseudo code. I will not write down a Turing machine. So, but still I should tell you the definition. And I'm going to, the, those notes give you the exact definition in some detail, uh, completely formalized. I'm just going to draw a sketch and I'm going to give you a very, very quick uh, summary of it. But I want you to read the notes carefully because you're supposed to be elite students that don't need your hands held every minute and have me read out things to you. So I'm going to tell you the idea. So in a Turing machine, <clears throat> in a Turing machine, you have a set of states And then you have a start state, you have an accept state, and you have a reject state. One start state, one accept state, one reject state. And then you have input symbols. Now, <clears throat> what we had in finite state machines was just the states and you could move from state to state as you read the input. In push down automata, you had states, you could move from state to state as you read the input and you also had a stack. So in a Turing machine, we're going to give you something other than the states for memory. We're going to give you a semi-infinite tape. Okay, so it looks like that tape. And the tape is divided into things called cells. What does semi-infinite mean? It means it has a starting point, but no ending point. So it has a left hand end, but no right hand end. It can go on forever. So it has unbounded memory, just like a stack. So pushdown automaton also was an infinite state machine. It had unbounded memory. Okay, now what, get, what is written on this tape is some sequence of symbols. So maybe, I don't know, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. And then maybe after that, it's all blanks. So I'll use this little symbol to mean blank. So the cells become blank. So of course, even though the tape is infinite, the thing that the machine is processing is a finite word. It's just that we're not going to put space limits on it. That's why we say the tape is infinite. So if it wants to use extra space, it can. It has something called a read head. So the machine reads one cell at a time. There is something called a tape alphabet, also finite, which contains the input alphabet. So you can have additional symbols in your tape alphabet that's not part of the input, but the machine gets to write additional symbols for its own use as it's doing a computation. And here is the huge difference between this and a stack. The, the, it's called the reading head. Can move left or right one cell at a time. So we'll write the transitions of the machine as something like this. Delta as this type. It takes a state, it takes a symbol. This is the symbol that's written in the cell which it's reading. <clears throat> and the output is a new state that tells you where it goes. It jumps arbitrarily, not arbitrarily, but according to its transition rules. It can also output a new symbol. 
And then there's a third component, which is just the one of the two letters L or R, which tells you that it moves left or right. So delta Q A, for example, may be Q prime B L. So this means the machine is in state Q. The read head, I don't know why it's called a head, it should be called an I, but anyway, the read head, I guess it's like the head on a tape, old fashioned tape recorder, which is reading the tape as the tape goes through. So <clears throat> there's a read head, the read head, is seeing the symbol A. It jumps, not it jumps, the machine jumps. The Turing machine moves to state Q prime. The A is erased and B is written in the cell. And then the read head moves one step. to the left, that's what it means when it's, you've got an L. Other transitions may have an R, which means it moves one step to the right. So what is crucial about this is that at each stage, only a finite amount of information is processed. which is why we want the alphabet to be finite. Okay, so you can't say, oh, well, in my alphabet, I am get to write real numbers in the cell <laughs> because, you know, a, a real number like pi cannot fit in one cell or indeed on any finite number of cells. Uh, <clears throat> so we are not even allowing you to say the integers can be put in the cells. If you want to use integers, you've got to say, well, they're integers, I don't know, base 17, and I've got you know 17 symbols for them, and I have to write write it out in place notation or indeed even in unary. It's very easy, or maybe not so easy, but it is easy to show that many uh, <clears throat> things that we saw were impossible with PDAs can be done with this A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. It's very easy. Okay, easy to see. A to the N, B to the N, C to the N. Can be recognized by a Turing machine. Because it's allowed to go back and forth. So it can go, it says, oh, I see an A. Let me go and check whether there's a B for it. Then it goes on and checks whether there's a C, then it backtracks and looks at the next A and goes on and checks the second B, the second C, and so on. And maybe every time it checks, it can change the lowercase A to a capital A to say, yeah, I've already seen this. So that's why you might have an enhanced tape alphabet. Very, very easy to imagine that something like this can work. But now a new thing happens. So first of all, let me just say what it means, uh, uh, how to describe the Turing machine a configuration
of a Turing machine is a description of its state and the tape contents of its state, the tape, and the position of the reading head. So for example, if you look at this one, maybe this thing is in stump state Q. So you want to describe all this, how will you describe it? You'll say, okay, we have a way of describing it as a string. We'll say it is in configuration 1101Q01. So this is to the left of the head. This is the state. And just to the right of the state symbol is the head is here. Okay, so does everybody understand clearly how the configuration is just a string? Okay, so it's just a convention that we write the state immediately to the left of the cell to at which the reading head is positioned. Now, as the Turing machine executes, it does transitions as dictated by Delta. And so we might get something like this. We might have a configuration that says, there's some string U, then there's A, the symbol A, right just to the left of the reading head. Then there's the reading head, which we indicate by writing the name of the state, Q sub I. And then, the reading head is looking at the cell B or the cell containing the letter B, and then there's some more stuff afterwards. So you see, even though the, the word on the tape might be very long, the machine can only see one cell at a time, but it can move either way. So unlike the stack where, you know, once you start popping the stack, you lose stuff. This thing you can, and it's because you can keep things that you have all the power of a full blown memory. So this is the configuration perhaps of the machine. We'll say this yields, that's the word I want to tell you, this yields a new configuration, U, Q, J, A, C, V. And this happens if Delta Q, I, B, so B is, this, is what, the thing is looking at at that instant. So the transition table will say, okay, if I'm looking at B and the state is QI, what happens next? So if the transition table says, well, you go to QJ, you erase the B and write C, and then you go one step to the left, you'll get exactly this. You see A was one step to the left. Now the reading head is looking at the A. And that's why we write it just to the left of the A. Okay. The V and the U are untouched. So this point I want to emphasize, this has changed to that. Everything else is unchanged. Only a three letter window is affected. All right, what does acceptance mean? So a new thing can, so acceptance. Start in a start configuration. So let's say acceptance of W by M. So W is some word. Start in a start configuration. And what does the start configuration look like? It has to look like this. This tape always starts at the left-hand end. And there are some restrictions which I've spelled out in the notes 
Like if you're the left hand end, you can't move further left because the tape has ended. <clears throat> okay. Um, so this is called a start configuration. You're at the left hand end, you're in the start state and you're ready to read the word. And then follow the transitions according to delta. And finally, so you have to go from one configuration to the next. Each configuration must yield the next one according to this definition of the word yield, i.e. the configurations change in the manner dictated by delta and then end up in an accept state. I should say in the accept state. Now people can ask me all kinds of questions, all of which I'm punting on and not answering, but questions like, why is there only one accept state? Why is there only one reject state? Blah, blah, blah. You know what? It doesn't matter. <clears throat> If you want 17 accept states, that can be coded up in a machine that has one accept state. So you get no additional power by doing those things. You'll see small variations in the definition. Some places do allow multiple accept states. None of these matter. These are not the important things to be obsessed about. So what's the important thing to be obsessed about? A new phenomenon. By the way, the word phenomenon is singular. The word phenomena is plural. I absolutely get crazy when people say a phenomena. <clears throat> so a new phenomenon. The machine may go into an infinite loop. So one of the conventions is the accept state and the reject state are the two halting states. Once it hits one of those states, it just stops. There are no transitions that take you out of it. Okay, and again, you might say, why not, blah, blah, blah. And you know what? Any of those things you're asking about, why can't I make it like this? And why can't I change it like that? All unimportant questions, I don't want to even deal with them. Why? Because I'm going to tell you much bigger things about what you can change. <clears throat> Okay, but here let's focus on this new phenomenon. The machine may go into an infinite loop. This we never had before. Never had this in PDAs, never had this in DFAs or NFAs because there always the reading was left to right once and bang, you're done. Okay. <clears throat> here you might say, oh, I'm going like this and then I'm going back to the, to the going back leftwards and then I'm moving rightwards again and then I, and it might be that the way you set up the machine for a particular word, it might just loop forever. And of course, we know this from our standard programming languages, they do go into loops. So now the notion of the language of a machine, it's the set of words such that M halts and accepts W. Okay, halts and accepts. So if W is not in the language of the machine, it does not mean, and I emphasize this, it does not mean that M rejects W. It could loop forever. So this basically has become kind of like a three valued logic now. It's not yes, no. There's a yes, no, and I don't know. <clears throat> and this is fundamental. This makes a huge difference to everything. Okay, so I'm going to introduce some words now because this concept is so important. This is what it's all about. Now, not everything can be answered. And we already have seen 
hey, does this thing halt? <laughs> this is an unanswerable question, at least algorithmically. By the way, people get confused about this. They think that it means that you can never look at a program and tell whether it halts. That's not true. Of course, specific programs, you can look at them and study them and prove that they halt. It just means there's no uniform single algorithm that will answer this question for everything. Okay, but for specific programs, they may well halt. And you may well be able to prove that. So let me introduce some words. We'll say L is Turing recognizable. If there exists a Turing machine M such that L equals the language of that Turing machine. So if your word is in the language, your machine will stop and say yes. If your word is not in the language, what will happen? Well, it might say no. It might say, gee, I don't know. And that's called Turing recognizable. So this is very different from what we had with any other kind of machine before. You'd say L is Turing decidable. If there exists Turing machine M such that for all W, if you run M on W, it halts and L equals the language of that machine. So here, for every word, you get a yes, no answer. So there's a big difference between Turing decidable and Turing recognizable. Any Turing decidable language So I'm going to stop saying Turing decidable and Turing de recognizable. I'll just say decidable. Any decidable language is, of course, recognizable. So some terminology, we say computably enumerable. Or CE for short, for recognizable. We say computable. For decidable. And I should just mention old terminology. And because I'm old, I sometimes slip into this terminology without realizing it. So I'm telling you so that if I accidentally say these words, you will know what I mean. So the old terminology was recursively enumerable. Or RE for CE and recursive for decidable. And possibly if you are, this change happened only in the last 20 years. So you'll lot, find lots of books and notes, including my old notes, in which I say RE, recursive, recursively enumerable. And I've tried to go through and change everything, but sometimes maybe I've missed it. Okay. So I've talked about Turing machines. I've not given you any examples because 
these are the things I want you to do yourself. So I want to talk very quickly about models of computation and the so-called Church-Turing thesis. But let me pause for questions. Haneli? There are no questions in the chat. No questions in the chat. How many people are uh, logged in? I can't see these things. 20, 21, not counting you. Okay. Now, um, You can ask the question now. So first of all, I should say, one can think. Of a Turing machine. As computing a function. F. From, I don't know, natural numbers to natural numbers instead of accepting a language. And we will use both these views, whichever one is convenient, they're totally equivalent. Because if I want to say the Turing machine is computing a function and I want to think, how do I translate that question into language acceptance? Well, then I'll say, all right, uh, does it accept all words of the form x comma f of x, where f of x is the, so you can translate any computing a function question into a, into a language acceptance question. And of course, any language acceptance question is a special case of a function question because it's simply asking, tell me the mapping from words to true false. So these are completely equivalent points of view. And sometimes I'll say the Turing machine computed this mathematical function or the Turing machine recognized this language or decided this language, all these are completely equivalent points of view. Okay, so in fact, after the break, when I talk about computability theory, we'll be looking at not as language acceptance so much, but as computing a function from input to output, probably in the integers, but maybe just between strings. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at Turing machine variations. So one thing that happened after the Turing machine invention is people proposed many different notions of computation. All turned out to be equivalent. And so actually this, is a, this was a period of about 20 years when people were saying, well, I have a different notion of computation. I have a different kind of machine. Instead of a tape, I have something else. Uh, and always it turned out that these were equivalent to Turing machines. So example, multi-tape Turing machine. So with a multi-tape Turing machine, you have many tapes, not just one, five or six tapes, or maybe 500. Each one has its own reading head and the heads move independently. And in one move, you can say, read all the cells that the heads are looking at based. So now you've got a gigantic transition table for, uh, for every possible combination of what each head might be reading and the state, you make a, a change of state and move each of the heads independently 
one step to the left or right. So they don't all move to the left or all to the right. They can all move however they want. This was equivalent to the ordinary Turing machine. And this is just a coding question. You make a you know, gigantic alphabet that codes all possible tuples. And, and so there was a lot of people doing ingenious coding things. I will show how to simulate a multi-tape Turing machine with a one-tape Turing machine and so on. And all these things are, you know, they're ancient history now, and I don't want to spend time showing how to do these codings. It might be fun for you to do it. But uh, if you can do a two-tape Turing machine with one tape, then clearly you can do an n-tape Turing machine with one tape, right? Because you keep producing tapes. So <clears throat> turns out multi-tape Turing machine makes no difference. Same power as one tape. Non-deterministic Turing machine equivalent to Turing machine. So this is an interesting thing. We saw DFA is equivalent to NFA. And then we said, oh, but if you give it a stack, then it's not equivalent anymore. Non-deterministic PDA, not the same as deterministic ones. Then you go to Turing machines, bang, they're equivalent again. So <clears throat> non-determinism didn't really help. Of course, it might be much more convenient to have a multi-tape Turing machine for some problem. You might say, oh, if only I had three tapes and I could do all these things. Sometimes when I'm cooking, I feel like that. If only I had three hands, I could do all kinds of things. So yeah, it's more convenient to have a multi-tape Turing machine, but not fundamentally more powerful. Okay, similarly, non-deterministic Turing machine, maybe you can write a much shorter non-deterministic Turing machine that just guesses the right way, but, but you can always simulate it with a deterministic one. N-dimensional Turing machine. So two-dimensional Turing machine is, instead of having a tape, you have a semi-infinite square grid and the head can just kind of wander around on this, on this surface instead of just being on a one-dimensional tape makes no difference, can be simulated with one tape. And of course, if you can do two dimensions with one, you can inductively get to n dimensions. So none of these things actually make any difference. That's why people ask, why do you have this? And why do you have two states and whatnot? All these things are really impossibly unimportant questions compared to these big changes that also seem not to make a difference. Whatever we do, now we feel we just do whatever we find convenient. But then people started proposing really different things. So there are post machines. So post machine said, well, I have queues and not, not, uh, not a tape. I have two queues and I can read at both ends and this and that. All of these were equivalent. Two stacks. This is equivalent to the Turing machine. I'll just give you a quick hand-waving reason why. So what you do to simulate a Turing machine with a two stack machine is you put the left hand side on one stack and the right hand side on the other stack of where the read head is. You encode the state with state. Uh, and then every time you make a transition, if you're moving to the left, you can move things from one stack to the other. If you're moving to the right, you can also simulate that by moving things from one stack to the other. So two stacks is perfectly nice simulation of a one tape Turing machine. Two counter, so this is a not so obvious. So these are machines that say, I am basically an NFA plus I have two integer variables that I can increment, increment and decrement. And that's equivalent to a Turing machine. Then people invented much more convenient programming models, for example, the RAM running assembly language. So this is what you learn in Comp 273, for example. This thing is equivalent to a Turing machine. It's much more convenient, of course, than a Turing machine to program, but much less convenient than a modern programming language. So, <clears throat> Here is a very important one. This is called while programs. So you have commands, skip, if a, then c1 else, 
C2. So if then else, you have assignment statements where A is some kind of language of arithmetic expressions. You are allowed to do sequencing of commands. And then you have while loops. So C stands for commands. And you have arithmetic expressions, which I'm not going to show explicitly, and Boolean expressions, which I'm also not going to show explicitly. So for the <clears throat> uh, if, then, else, and the while, you can have arithmetic or Boolean expressions. So maybe this should be done with Boolean expressions. The update can be done with arbitrary arithmetic expressions. You can get Booleans by doing and and or and comparison of arithmetic expressions or whatever. And then you have these basic commands that you can execute. And this allows you to build long programs by just sequencing commands. So while programs are also equivalent to Turing machines. And in fact, any modern programming language equivalent to a Turing machine. Well, it's equivalent to a universal Turing machine. So people tell you, oh, this language is powerful. Sorry, that's nonsense. You could please tell them that because <laughs> there is no such thing as one language being more powerful than another. They all can simulate each other. Some languages may be better designed and super convenient. <clears throat> For example, OCaml, uh, or it can be complete shit like Python, but they're all of equal power. <clears throat> okay. Uh, and then there were many other things. Lambda calculus. Combinatory logic, which is actually older than Lambda calculus. and various other things like post-production systems. Uh, so there's something called phrase structure grammars coming from linguistics. They're all equivalent. Various term rewriting formalisms that say you can take strings and rewrite them according to certain rules. Uh, so these are called semi-2A systems, all of these things. So with everything equivalent, people can ask, are all possible formalisms equivalent? So I wanted to make this list long. <laughs> I could have told you a couple of examples and then said everything in sight is equivalent but I want to make this list long because we don't have a theorem. We don't know. But we strongly believe so. So by the way, people might say things like, what about, uh, <clears throat> so this thing is called the Church Turing Thesis. By the way, it's easy to make a formalism that's less powerful. For example, you can say, well, I'm only allowing you to have loops that go up from one to 10 and not more than that. Well, that's certainly not going to get you all possible computable functions. <clears throat> but we strongly believe that there's nothing you can do to get more computational power than what any of these things. So now we have this kind of abstract idea. There's this notion of computable function that's independent of the mechanical model. So we believe
there is a notion of computable functions independent of any specific model of computation. So I left out a very important word here. We believe, we have no proof of such a thing. And it's not even clear what a proof would look like. So this is kind of a philosophical issue. So let me emphasize this word. It's not the church during theorem. It's the church during thesis. So you can start um, babbling about physics and say, well, gosh, is the spectrum of hydrogen computable or not? Uh, <clears throat> Some things we do know. So people said, ah, well, there's this thing called quantum computation where we use quantum bits or qubits and we use unitary transformation. So we now know that that has no more expressive power than classical computability. So when people say quantum computation is more powerful, they mean in a complexity theory sense that certain algorithms will run fast, but there's no such thing as an algorithm that's impossible classically compared to one that is uh, possible quantum mechanically. So maybe I can say a bit about my personal research life. So one of my first uh, contributions was <clears throat> I proved that certain things were impossible, uh, but in a completely different sense. So when we start talking about distributed computing, then the notion of exactly what is computable becomes more complicated. So to give you an example of what I mean, supposing I say, hmm, can I write a Turing machine that writes down all the prime numbers? And you say, well, of course not. It won't be a halting Turing machine. You might be able to write down the prime numbers, computing them one after the other and write them on a tape but it's never going to halt because there are infinitely many prime numbers. So if you define computing to mean, I'm running this algorithm and when it halts, I look at the answer. Well, then of course you have a certain notion of computability and all this church Turing stuff, uh, what we believe is in that context. But if you say, oh, I've got one Turing machine that's computing something and it's tape is actually being fed into another Turing machine that's doing something, so then you say, mm, well, the first guy doesn't even have to halt. The second guy can start processing the information already. Now the story becomes much more complicated. And then you can start worrying about what's possible and what's impossible. And the whole story gets more complicated. And one of my contributions was to prove some theorems in this area when you have distributed computing and it's not, not so clear. But going back to the world of sequential deterministic computation, Church Turing is sacred. No proof, but we absolutely believe it. Okay, so uh, my notes are on the lambda calculus, <clears throat> but I will save that for a later lecture. I uh, will pause now for 12 minutes We'll resume at 12 sharp.
So I have minimized my view so that only one person is showing. And for some reason, it appears to be Maria. Can you just turn on your camera, please? Yes. Thanks. So now I have at least one face looking at me. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I'm looking at a blank screen. OK, good. So I would like to, uh, how much time do I have? Is it one and a half hours now? Or what? only one hour? Darn, OK, I better hurry. Um, <clears throat> Everything is very breathless in this part of the course. So I would like to talk about theory of computation now. So I'm not a big fan of homework assignments where you write code for Turing machines. You do enough of low level coding in Comp 273 and 206. So you don't need more of that from me. So I want to focus instead on theory of computability, which is what the assignment question on assignment three is about. <clears throat> so first, just some background uh, kind of discrete math. We use this boldface N for the natural numbers. Uh, I asked if people knew about countable and uncountable sets and everybody assured me that they did. So let me remind you of some important facts. Uh, we say two infinite sets are equipollent. If there exists a bijection between them. And the big difference between an infinite set and a finite set is that an infinite set can be in bijective correspondence with a proper subset of itself. So there's a bijection between the set of natural numbers and the set of even numbers. And obviously the even numbers are a proper subset of the natural numbers, yet there's a bijection between them. <clears throat> uh, whereas of course you can't do that with a finite set. You can actually take this as the definition of what it means for a set to be infinite. Then Cantor showed us that there is no bijection between n and two to the n. Where two to the n you can think of as subsets or of sequences of zeros and ones. But there is a bijection between n cross n and n. And this may be a bit surprising. How can pairs of integers be the same size as single in integers? Uh, but the fact is there is such a bijection and I've put up notes in which I have explicitly written down this bijection. So in one direction, you can actually write down a formula for the other direction you have to write like a small program that's guaranteed to terminate that will invert the bijection. So the point is anytime I have a pair of numbers, they can be coded as a single integer. Injections from n cross n to n are easy to write. 
and of course injections from N to N cross N are very easy to write. <clears throat> and there's a nice theorem called the Schroeder-Bernstein theorem, which says, if you have two sets with injections both ways, then there must exist a bijection. So even if you don't know explicit bijections, if you right away, you can see that there has to be a bijection between N cross N and N. Anyway, this is the important point. They can be coded as a single integer and the translation is computable. So from the point of view of computation, if you say, well, I have this thing that takes pair of integers and the thing that takes a single integer, it can all be coded up. So there's not a big essential difference. Okay, so let me say a bit more about functions now. Functions from n to n, we write it with this notation. So these are functions from n to n. I like this arrow notation because it kind of tells you this is where you start from, this is where you end up. But we now have algorithms that may produce no output, that may loop forever. And produce no output. We model this by partial functions. So F goes from N and I'll use a half arrow, sometimes called a harpoon. I think in LaTeX it's backslash harpoon. Anyway, half arrow, this means partial functions. So F is not defined for every little N in N. That's why it's called partial. If it was defined on every n, we'd call it total. So we have partial functions. And we use actually the same notation as we used for halting and diverging. We'll write f of n with a down arrow if f is defined on n. And we'll write f of n up arrow means F is not defined. On N. And we'll write domain of F is the set of N such that F is defined on those N. Okay, so that's what a partial function is. When we write f equals g as partial functions, we mean domain of f equals domain of g. And for all n in the domain of f, f of n equals g of n. But we now have a new concept that we didn't have with ordinary functions. We have the notion of f is less than g. So this means domain of f is contained in the domain of g. And for all n in the domain of f, which of course is also in the domain of g now, we have f of n equals g of n. So this means wherever f is defined, g is also defined and f and g agree. But it might be that g is defined in some places where f is not defined. So this is now a partial order structure. This is a partial order.
So this looks like set inclusion the way we've written it here. Well, this is set inclusion, but this is just a partial order relation. And there is a bottom element. i.e. less than any other partial function, which is the everywhere undefined function. That's by our definition, a partial function. It's domain, empty set. <clears throat> and it's very easy to write a program that implements it. <laughs> you just say, ignore the input and go into loop. Okay, good. Let me define the range of a partial function is the set of M such that there exists N in the domain of F such that f of n equals m. So the domain of f is the set of values it can accept as input. The range is the set of values it can produce as output. So of course, even with ordinary functions, the range of f may not be the, all of the natural numbers. Not, not every function is a subjection. OK. <clears throat> so. Um, <clears throat> When discussing computability, N is not so important. There's no real difference between n and any tuple, so n to the k, if there's a bijection from n to n cross n, and obviously also to n, n cross n cross n and so on, any finite tuple. So if I want to use you know, 17 tuples, it makes no real difference. I'm not gonna fuss about it. There's no real difference between n and n to the k or sigma star, even with a countable alphabet. <clears throat> but there is a big difference with the real numbers because the real numbers precisely are not countable. And the theory of computability with real numbers is fascinating, brings you into contact with a subject called computable topology and uh, too fascinating to discuss here basically. <laughs> so I won't say anything more about it. <clears throat> when I'm describing algorithms, I'm not gonna be fast. If I feel like writing it in C++, then I'll do that. That's very unlikely, but mostly I will use pseudocode or some kind of semi-formal English description. I'm certainly not gonna write on big Turing machine tables. I remember one year when I had, was new to McGill, there was a knock on my door and a famous professor of philosophy whom I won't name, now retired, entered and introduced himself and I asked him to sit down and he said, he's looking for a student to implement a program that he wrote uh, to compute girdle numbers. So I said, oh, well, okay. It didn't look like a very challenging program because it's the kind of thing you can write in an afternoon using Lisp, but he wanted to hire him for the summer <laughs> to write this program. And so I said, well, uh, you know, these kinds of programs are not so difficult to write if you use a programming language adapted to symbolic processing like Camel or Lisp or something like that. And he said, yes, okay, I never heard of these things. And then he unfolded this huge piece of computer paper you know, the old style computer paper, which he had glued together and made this gigantic thing that went over the edges of my table, which was just one gigantic Turing machine diagram. 
So I'm not going to do stuff like that. If I want to show you an algorithm, it will be in some sort of uh, whatever clear notation I can <clears throat> I can uh, I can write in. I just want to uh, emphasize. Uh, professor, there is a question. Yeah. How do we know we have a bijection between n and sigma star? Yeah, figure it out, please. It's not difficult. Okay, so um, <clears throat> some students write steps that are not algorithmic. And I want to give examples. Okay. <clears throat> so, so they say, wait for M to halt. If it doesn't halt, then do something. Now this is nonsense. <laughs> you can't say, I waited for it to not halt and then I did something. Yes, you can put an if then else with M halted as the predicate, but you will never get to the else. So please don't write algorithms <laughs> that feature things like this. Then people write stuff like check on every word if blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Sorry, there are infinitely many words. So maybe you, it makes sense in certain semi-algorithms. So semi-algorithms are algorithms that don't always halt. And we will see many things like this, but many people seem to think that this is a halting step. Okay, so neither, it might be sometimes you have to do things like this, but please don't expect that these are going to be halting steps. And this, people don't seem to get this. They seem to casually write, I did, waited for the thing to halt and after it didn't halt, I did this. I mean, please don't write stuff like that. Okay, good. <clears throat> so, um, I'm going to give a formal definition of a set of natural numbers being computable. So first, a function f from n to n. So you notice I'm using the partial function symbol here. So it's a partial function. A function f from n to n is computable. If there is an algorithm A such that For, for all n in domain of f, a halts and the output is f of n. Okay, so that's what it means for a partial function to be computable. <clears throat> so we'll say a set of natural numbers so that x is computable so now I'm going to use this word strongly or decidable
if its characteristic function, so people who've studied probability theory are used to calling this thing indicator function, if its characteristic function chi sub x, which is defined like this, one, if n is an x and zero, if n is not an x, is total computable. So to say that it's total computable means that there is a halting algorithm, a always halting algorithm that will answer this question. So in that case, we'll say the set of natural numbers is computable. So the first proposition An infinite set of natural numbers is decidable if and only if it is the range of a total non-decreasing computable function. Okay, so let's prove this. So non-decreasing, by the way, means that if x is less than y, then f of x is less than f of y. You can't suddenly go down in value. The value is always steadily increasing. It may stay constant for a while, but it cannot go down. <clears throat> So, so supposing we have X and we have f as above. Ie x equals range of f. And we have an always terminating algorithm for F. So we call this A. Okay. So now, what is the decision procedure for being in X? So we have X, and we want to know is X in capital X? All right, so basically you run A on zero, one, two, three. Eventually, you may get 
a run on n gives you x, then say yes, x in x. Or you may get a of n strictly bigger than x, then stop and say no, x not in x. So there's your decision procedure. And why is this a decision procedure? A always halts. So you know this thing was going to happen and you know eventually you will cross x because uh, <clears throat> we have an infinite set with that range. So it can't be stuck at some finite n at all times. Okay. For the reverse direction, what have we got? So assume we have a decision procedure. For, uh, for X, call it B. Okay, so B is an algorithm such that when you run it on any input, it will tell you this thing is in X or not. Okay, so you run B on zero, one, two, as soon as it says yes for the first time. You say f of zero equals for the first time, let's say on x, you say f of zero equals x. Let's say it's x zero. And then second time, it says yes on x1, you say f of one equals x1, and you go on like this. So obviously the range of this function f that you're defining is exactly x. And it's an infinite set, and it's certainly non-decreasing because you're trying running B systematically on larger and larger values. Okay, good. So now we come to the important theorem, which is <clears throat> based not on this nice computable situation, but the situation where some things may diverge. So we'll say a set of natural numbers is called enumerable. So there's a big difference between computable and enumerable. All kinds of things can be enumerated that can't be computed. Enumerable or computably enumerable if there is an algorithm that lists all the members of X and only the members of X in some order, not necessarily increasing order.
Okay, so some arbitrary order. So of course, if X is infinite, A is not ever halting, but here we're considering it to be actually producing output. <clears throat> so A may not halt. And in fact, it will not halt if X is an infinite set. So it's going to keep on spitting out the elements of X in some order, but it produces every element in X eventually. with absolutely no guarantee of when and in what order. Now, if it was guaranteeing to produce elements of X in increasing order, it would have to be actually a decidable set. That was the previous proposition, because we say we're waiting for 17, and then it's enumerated 15, and then 19, and then we go, oh dear, 17 is not going to be there. But now it's coming out in some absolutely unpredictable order we just don't know. Maybe three has not appeared yet, but maybe after a long time, three will come. We just don't know. But if it's an enumerable set, it will produce it. And here is the important theorem that I want to prove. A set X is CE or enumerable if and only if one of three conditions. One, it is the domain of some it is the domain of a computable function. That's condition one. Two, the range of a computable function and always I mean partial function here. And three, chi of x, the characteristic function is computable. But actually, uh, so let me say, not chi of x. I need a different notation because this is not exactly the usual chi. So where s of x is defined as follows. <clears throat> Give me an n and it's one if n is an x and undefined if n is not an x. Okay, so it's kind of the semi-characteristic function. <clears throat> so, I'm not going to prove all parts of this. These are in the notes. Okay. So supposing, so I want to prove that computably enumerable implies one and three. So you can see three automatically implies one because it's a specific instance of a computer computable function which has this thing as its domain. So I'm going to prove that computably enumerable implies three. And supposing I have, an, supposing A is the enumerating algorithm. For X. So this means A keeps on running and eventually you will spit out any element in X. So you want to know 
the value of s of x on n, run a and wait for n to be enumerated. Basically, and once it's new enumerated, you output one. And if it's never enumerated, you're just never producing anything. But that's what S is required, only a semi-computable function. Okay, so it can be undefined. So this is kind of a trivial fact. I'm going to ignore two in this class, but it's in the notes. The interesting thing is when uh, <clears throat> the converse proof. Okay, so suppose I have an algorithm B to compute F. And suppose that the domain of F is exactly the set that I'm looking at. So I want to show that this set can be enumerated. Okay, so here is the idea. Run B on zero. If it terminates, output zero as part of your enumeration. Run B on one. If it terminates, right, output one as part of your enumeration and so on. Run B on N if it terminates. And you keep going. So of course enumerators are allowed to run forever, but this is crazy. How can I say run B on zero? If it terminates, do this, yes. And if it doesn't terminate, then what? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> How can I run B on one if B does not terminate on zero first? So this is doing exactly what I said, students write, run this, and if it doesn't halt, do that. Well, so here is how you do it. We use a technique called dovetailing. And here's how dovetailing works. So you say, run B on zero for one step. Maybe in one step it tells you right away, maybe not. Then you suspend it. Suspend. Then run B on one for two steps. And suspend. Then you run B on zero for two more steps and always you suspend. Then you run B on one for two more steps. Then you run B on two for two more for two steps. Okay, so 
you keep returning to zero. So in the next round, you do zero, one, two, three, each for three steps. Okay, and <clears throat> then you go back and then you do zero, one, two, three, four, each time extending the computation. So each time you extend the computation. So what's happening? Eventually, you will run it for enough steps to terminate if the thing is indeed in X. It might take many phases of returning back to that computation. So maybe the computation for zero is really long and the computation for one is very short. So very quickly you'll decide one is in the set or one is not in the set. And maybe after 10 million phases, you'll come back and finally zero will finish and say no. <clears throat> well, not no, say yes. And then you finally get to include zero, but maybe never. So you'll never enumerate zero. Of course, you cannot predict how long some of these are going to be quick. Some of them might be very long. Some of them might take forever. So they will come out in some random order. But the point is every number is eventually tested for as long as it takes to verify that it is in the set. The order in which it is output is not in your control. because you have no idea of how long it takes this algorithm to decide on each particular case. And some things of course never get output. You keep coming back to them and the computation keeps going. And because it's not actually in the set, you'll never find that out. Okay, so this is a very, very important concept called dovetailing. And it was a revolutionary idea. People realized that lots of things that seemed out of reach are actually possible. And it shows you that some things can be done even when they look impossible. Okay, so I'm going to now claim some properties of uh, computably enumerable sets without proof because they're kind of easy. The union and intersection of two R, uh, CE sets is CE. And the proof, well, union, you run the two enumerators in parallel. If you have only one Turing machine, you can do the same suspension trick. You run it for a while then suspend it and run the other one for a while and go back and forth. This is exactly how an operating system pretends that it's concurrent when actually it's sequential. So, in effect, you can run the two machines in parallel. If they both say yes, then you say yes, it's in the set. And that way you get the intersection. If at least one says yes, you say yes. That's the way you get the union. How about complement? The answer is not always. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. So now we come to uh, the proposition that answers this question. If a set X and its complement X 
x bar r both c e then they are both computable let me emphasize decidable aha <laughs> so I'm not going to write the proof down, but it's clear actually. You run the enumerator for x and the enumerator for x complement in parallel. Now, a given number has to be in one of those two sets. So, one of them is at some point going to say yes. So, you're guaranteed not to have to wait forever without being satisfied. You will eventually find out. So, this means, of course, you now have a decision procedure for x. If the x complement machine enumerates it, you know it's not in X. So you can answer no. And if the X machine enumerates it, then you know it is an X. So you can answer yes. So you have a halting algorithm and they are both X and X complement become decidable sets. So this is kind of an obvious fact, uh, <clears throat> but still significant. And this is called post theorem. Okay, obviously any decidable set is CE. <clears throat> now, remember I said we have pairs of natural numbers. So I'll write NM, the element of N encoding the pair. N comma M. And I'll Assume that I have functions pi one, which goes from n to n, pi one and pi two, these are both, and pi one applied to the encoding of nm will give you n, pi two applied to the encoding of nm will give you m. Okay, so this function, and this is a function of type n cross n to n, pi one and pi two are all computable, are all total computable. And one of the handouts actually gives you the code for pairing and for uh, this. Okay, so now we have a theorem. Again, easy. <clears throat> A set of natural numbers is computably enumerable if and only if there exists a decidable set Y Uh, <clears throat> such that for all x in x, uh, sorry, not there exists. I said for all and then I wrote there exists. I should be smacked for that. <laughs> for all x in x, <clears throat> x is in x if and only if there exists a little y in the natural numbers such that the encoding of x, y belongs to y. Okay, so remember this set is only computably enumerable, but the set Y is actually decidable. So if Y is decidable, or even just CE, 
we enumerate its members. And project and compute pi one of each. So this enumerates X. Why doesn't it decide X? Well, because you might search forever to find that second component that matches uh, X, Y being in Y. Now, <clears throat> it's the reverse that's tricky because you start out with only a CE set. How am I going to get a decidable set like this out of it? So what you do is you say, if X is enumerable, define X comma N to be in Y if the enumerator for X produces X within N steps. So in fact, this is decidable. Right, because why do things become undecidable? Because you're sitting there waiting for output and you have no idea when it's going to stop. But if your specification says, I'm checking whether your output within n steps, then after n steps, you stop and say no. By putting a time bound, it has suddenly become decidable. But now you're existentially quantifying over that time bound basically through this existential quantifier over y. Right? So now, of course, it's clear x is an x if and only if there exists some n such that x of n is in y. This is going to be the first step on a long journey up the hierarchy of undecidable problems. So basically, time bounded halting problem is decidable. So if I ask you, does this program stop in 100 steps? Well, yeah, it's certainly decidable. You run it for 100 steps and see, has it halted or not? So you can always answer this. It's only when I now put an existential quantifier in front of it and I say, does there exist an N <laughs> such that it halts within N steps? And I've not specified the N, so it could be any N. Now it has become undecidable. So you see, Existential quantifiers, E makes decidable problems undecidable. Okay, so <clears throat> you might ask, what does this do? So this makes decidable problems not just uh, <clears throat> also undecidable, but in a different way. which is perhaps a mysterious remark, which I will explain over the coming classes. Okay, so there was nothing 
technically difficult that I did today or con convoluted, except possibly understanding that dovetailing, how dovetailing works. Um, but these are a whole bunch of new concepts. We're going to start doing some more intricate things uh, on Monday, where we have to do some, we have to expand the scope of our undecidable problems. So <clears throat> I will formally stop the class here. So I guess the first thing I should do is stop sharing. And the second thing I should do is stop recording.